Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar. We are going to be exploring a very interesting and pertinent topic in today's time. So we'll be looking at boosting engineering efficiency through open telemetry, Captain and Tyke. We are specifically looking at how insights can drive efficiency in organizations. And we'll be looking at different sides and aspects of that. I am Buddha, your host, product evangelist and developer advocate here at Tyke, and I'll be your host, co-presenter and facilitator for today's session. I'll take you through the entire journey of this conversation, uh, picking up your questions as we go along as well. So that's going to be my role. Hopefully, uh, we'll have a really good time together. Joining me on this journey today are two amazing panelists, uh, starting off with Andreas or Andy. Uh, he is the DevOps activist at Dynatrace, as well as a developer advocate at Captain. Uh, super cool titles, all of them. So hello and welcome, Andy. It's really good to have you with us. All right. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, please keep calling me Andy. That's always what I say. Friends call me Andy. Unless I offend somebody, feel free to call me Andreas. Otherwise, <laughs> Andy is good. Andy it is then. I think um, we'll, we'll keep it that way. So thank you so much, Andy, for joining us. Also joining us is our very own Sonia. She is the group product manager here at Tyke, but more importantly, she's also the subject matter specialist, subject matter expert, as well as the driving force behind Tyke's open <laughs> telemetry uh, here uh, with us. So thank you so much for joining once again and really, really looking forward to you sharing more about all things open telemetry. So welcome, yeah, Sonia. Thank you for thank you for having me and to help us advocate on open telemetry and getting insights. That's a topic that you know I'm really passionate about. Indeed. I am looking forward to it as much as myself, as much as everybody else here. So hopefully uh, just a few sort of housekeeping things here. If you've got any questions at any point of time, do feel free to post that in the Q&A section below. Um, we will be taking questions as we, towards the end of the session, but if there is something that specifically pops up uh, during the discussion as well, I'll keep an eye out for that. We are live streaming right now on YouTube, so I'm keeping an eye out on the comments there too. So if you've got anything, any feedback, anything coming up, anything that comes to your mind, feel free to add those as well. So what do we have in store for you today? We are going to be looking at, beyond the introductions, we're going to be looking at GitOps. Again, it's a very pertinent topic when we talk about efficiency, specifically from a DevOps, DevOps perspective. Mm -hmm. GitOps comes up pretty frequently, and I think we want to look a little bit more into the what, how, and why of GitOps. We'll then look at the Dora metrics and what the importance of that is, how you measure dev DevOps efficiency through that. We'll introduce you to the concepts of uh, open telemetry and the benefits around it followed by observability of uh, deployments using Captain. This is where Andy will come in and he'll do a bit of a demo, uh, showcasing how you can have better insights when you are doing deployments and making that more efficient. We'll be following that up with Sonia, who's going to be telling us all about API observability with Tyke and demonstrating how you can troubleshoot your APIs and get better insights for your APIs with Tyke and Dynatrace. So all very, very exciting things to come. And for last but not least, of course, we've got the Q&A segment where we'll be having a bit of a discussion and taking questions from the audience as well as perhaps questions from me as well, because I'm a curious mind here. So I'm learning as I'm going along. So uh, with that being said, I'm going to go over to our topic for today. So where do we stand in today's world? We have pandemics, we have a war, we have economic uncertainty to a point where there is a panicked market and we have regulatory failures in certain cases, uh, which has all led to an environment where things are not really as predictable anymore. It is quite uncertain. It's led to organizations needing to take drastic steps. It's led to them letting go of a few people. Um, and it's all been a little bit messy to say the least. And, um, you know, we don't exactly know how things are going to progress in the near future. So things may stay along for a little bit, little bit longer with this case um, or get better, hopefully sooner rather than later. But all of that is to say that the conversation has now shifted with, okay, what can we do with what we've got today? How do we do more with what we have? Um, and the conversation immediately shifts towards the ideology or idea of efficiency. How do we get more efficient? How do we do things better? How do we do things more effectively? And different teams within an organization have different perspectives to this. And I think what efficiency would mean to an engineering team or a DevOps team would be quite different from what it might mean for a marketing team or a sales 
um, sales or commercial teams as well. And every one of those is going to be important. They'll be contributing to the success of success, survival of a business in these uncertain times. And I think Today, what we are going to be looking at is specifically, we'll be looking at the engineering efficiency side of things, specifically from the perspective of DevOps. So with all of this being said, obviously, you start thinking about how do you get more efficient, you start putting in plans together, you start strategizing, and executing that, of course, as quickly as possible. And all of that is fantastic. And all that is great. But while you're strategizing and executing a plan, how do you figure out whether it's working? I think ultimately the whole conversation around efficiency and effectiveness comes down to getting better metrics, getting understanding what is happening. And that is where today's discussion becomes very, very important. We want to know what is going right. We want to know what is going wrong. How do you make better decisions for your product? How do you make better decisions for the tools that you're using? How do you make better decisions for your business as a whole? And all of that is encapsulated in the idea of observability, telemetry, and hopefully as an extension to open telemetry that we'll explore later. But before we go there, let's look at, like I said, we're going to be looking at it from the DevOps perspective. So let's look a little bit towards the DevOps life cycle, so to speak. So it's a bit of a, it's an infinite loop, so to speak, or a feedback loop, as I would call it, an iterative loop would be a better way of putting it. It starts off with the planning, coding and building and testing and then releasing. That's the developer side of things, the dev development side of things. And we move on to the operational side with um, deployments and operations and monitoring. And then it feeds all the way back into planning and the cycle continues. And it's a, like I said, it's a very iterative process. And what we want to explore with the idea of efficiency is to make this cycle go faster, make these iterations be smoother, be more efficient for the lack of a better word. And uh, whatever percentage gains that you can get through this is what is going to contribute towards that whole efficiency strategy that you might have better maximizing your return on investments, uh, doing more with less. I think the entire conversation is hinged towards that. So when we talk about this, obviously the, the, the idea of automation comes in and the idea of automation is driven in the DevOps world by GitOps. So you would have probably heard this in the context of CICD or uh, infrastructure as code, but really GitOps is a set of practices for managing infrastructure and application configuration in a declarative and version control way and ultimately, it's an enabler for infrastructure automation. And I'm specifically looking at API infrastructure automation because that's where the context of today's conversation is going to go. But GitOps can be applied to your entire application stack. So, you know, it, it can be applied to different aspects. It is a set of principles, not a set of tools. So you can use tools to enable you to be GitOps ready uh, or enable your GitOps journey. But GitOps by itself is more of a framework and guiding principle than anything else. It tells you how you can approach things for it to be more efficient, be automated. So I think I, I like this quote from someone who mentioned GitOps as just infrastructure as code done right. And we'll look at what that being done right means. So with GitOps, there is a few key principles that you need to be aware of um, and four primary principles here. And when you think about those principles, you look at how the system behaves, what your system needs to be. So the system is our system needs to be defined declaratively. What that means is that you're describing what the desired state of your system is going to be instead of describing or defining a set of instructions. You'd look at what that end, end game is or the end result is going to be, what the outcome is going to be or the end state is going to be as opposed to how you get there step by step. So that's what the first principle. Um, the second one is version. The system needs to be version and immutable. So this is sort of handled through um, versioning of your entire code base sort of in, in, in Git. This is where your infrastructure at code, as code conversation comes in. It's all version Git, which means that it is a lot easier for you to roll back things because your state is uh, maintained as different versions. It's immutable, which means that, again, if you're looking at audits, you can go back in history and look at what's how things have evolved and gotten to the point that you are at right now. So rolling back and recovery of systems becomes really, really easy and simple with this. 
Your system, again, it needs to be pulled automatically, which means that your approved changes are automatically applied to the system, which again comes from a host of automated testing and checks that you would have in place. It would also enable you to uh, put policies in place. It's driven by policies that would enable all of these to, to take effect. Once again, you're trying to minimize the amount of manual inputs or human effort that is required for you to actually make these deployments happen. And then finally, you look at continuous reconciliation, which is where you've got software agents which ensure the correctness and correctness of what you're doing, as well as um, the they alert you if there is any divergence in this. This would be sort of your principles of GitOps, um, which I've gone through quite quickly, uh, but ultimately this is the gist of what GitOps is built on. So then why is this important? What is the benefit of actually using this? Principles are great, but what's the actual benefit of it? Moving on to the benefits here. So we've got five key things that I've distilled down, and I think different people might again have different ways of looking at it. So my objective here is looking at it from the spectrum of productivity. So faster, more efficient, more frequent deployments made easier. If you've got a pipeline that is defined, that makes all of this easy without a whole lot of human intervention with the right checks and balances in place, this becomes a lot, lot easier for you to manage. Cost efficient, of course, because you know, you're reducing the amount of down, downtime cost probability here. You're better managing your resources a little bit more. Again, human intervention is reduced. That means things are moving a lot quicker, a lot faster, reducing the amount of time and effort required here. Reliability, because again, we spoke about things being version and gate, it's immutable, it's easy to roll back things and it makes life a lot easier from an errors perspective as well. You're less prone to errors because you've got the right checks and balances in place already. Compliance and security um, makes for simplified auditing and access control. You've got all that managed already. You've got credentials management taken care of a lot easier as well, uh, especially in a, in a cluster, cluster environment or orchestration environment like Kubernetes. And then finally, we've got developer experience where, you know, instead of having to deal with a whole lot of tools within these pipelines, you really work with Git, something that most developers are familiar with, have worked with, and therefore it gives or makes for consistent and familiar practices and tools that would again make life a lot more easier and productive. So with that being said, of course, now while the benefits are great, but how do you measure success of that? So which is what brings us to how do you measure the value of GitOps, specifically the business value of GitOps? And this is where we have, well, enter Dora. Well, when I talk about Dora, this is not this Dora, um, not Dora the Explorer per se, but perhaps Dora the metrics person in this case. So Dora stands for DevOps Research and Assessment. This is what this is essentially a way for you to measure DevOps efficiency. And there are four key things that you need to look at or is looked at under Dora metrics here, where we look at deployment frequency, how often an organization successfully releases to production. We look at lead time for changes, where the amount of time it takes to commit to get to production is important. Change failure rates, where you look at the percentage of deployments causing a failure in production, and then time to restore um, a service. I think this is, again, um, quite important because how long it takes an organization to recover from failure is an important metric for you to understand. Again, from a GitOps perspective, all of these really, really important for you to know. So if you look at the first two of these, these are really depend talking about the velocity of your progress, whereas the second ones are more towards the stability of your system. And I think that's what you're trying to measure here. So um, with that, hopefully that gives you a little bit of a little bit of an understanding of what we are talking about. We're starting off with the DevOps lifecycle, GitOps as sort of an enabler of the automation journey that we are looking at, Dora metrics as the way for you to measure um, success. And then we'll then bring it all back into the world of observability and GitOps needs observability. This is because when we talk, spoke about GitOps, we were talking about a desired state, a state where we are going to be looking at where, again, things are automated, things where we want to have less and less of human intervention. But the challenge there is you also need to know when to course correct or what is going right or what is going wrong in this case. So that different difference between um, desired state versus actual state is what you need to know. And that is, the, that is the question that observability in this case needs to answer or speak to. So you need to understand what is going on within your system and whether there are deviations, if it's all working well, that's fantastic, double down on that. But if there are deviations, then how do you make sure that it, you're not going too far apart uh, before you make or you know find things that needs to be changed? So that brings us to open telemetry, uh, which is what we're gonna be discussing today. OpenTelemetry is an open source observability framework for collecting, processing, and exporting 
telemetry data. It's essentially to help you gain better visibility and into the performance of your distributed systems. As you can see, it is actually supported by a whole lot of different tools in the industry already. There's a second most popular open source project in CNCF right now after Kubernetes, which as you know, most of you might be familiar here already. Uh, it has a really, really big active community today uh, and it's only growing in popularity with more and more tools adopting this open standard. So why is this beneficial for you to consider? Uh, it as a no-brainer, gives you better monitoring capabilities. It gives you better service health, response times, errors, better insights is what we are looking at. It also provides you with a common language. It's vendor neutral. It's open source. It gives you an open standard, common language for you to integrate with, with tools externally, as well as its support for multiple tools enables you to, again, add all of those things to your stack, have specific tools that look at the same data differently and provide you with better insights and, and monitoring. And then finally, that'll help you make better product decisions through better product insights, better usage metrics, product issues are highlighted earlier, and then you have a more data-driven approach to decision-making in your organization. So with that, um, I bring it full circle back into our DevOps life cycle. And once again, this is important because this is what we're going to be talking about. And uh, Andy will be looking at it specifically from the deployment side of things and can get better with that side. Whereas um, Sonia is going to be looking at it more from the APIs life cycle side of things and how you can troubleshoot your APIs a little bit better and, and get more insights from it. So I bring it all back. The idea, the objective of today is going to be to make this cycle more efficient and help you get started with that journey or be better at the journey that you already are um, on today. So with that, I think uh, hopefully that gave you a bit of an introduction into what we're going to be discussing today, some background on uh, the different concepts that we are touching upon. And with that, I'm going to head over to Andy. Um, I have mentioned Andrea's here, but I'm going to say over to you, Andy. Thank you so much, Buddha. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, let me share my screen. I hope I can just take away your sharing rights. Here we go. Um, just quickly, in case you want to follow up later with me, I know you were probably sending out anyway information, but uh, who am I? I was introduced in the beginning, but in case you joined late, I during a day, I work for Dynatrace and the rest of the time I work for Captain. Well, obviously I do work also during my day for Captain. I'm a uh, DevRel and a maintainer for the open source project. Today, I also want to quickly mention that besides open telemetry and Captain, I want to highlight open feature as well as another open source project in the CNCF space, because open feature also will make it easier for you to deploy uh, new features in a more risk aware way. So in case you're into feature flagging, and you've never heard about it, maybe open feature is something you want to look into as well. But Buddha, you started with this slide here, and you also ended before you passed it over, the DevOps infinity loop. And as you correctly said, the Dora metrics are really here to give us insights in how well we are doing, how well we are pushing out changes from code all the way into like building it, testing it, releasing it. And then on the right side, I have the change failure rate and time to restore services, which are more metrics that show you how mature you are in terms of uh, operating your software, how fast you can recover from a problem. So. I want to focus specifically now in my presentation on observing the Dora metrics from a build to deploy perspective. And then Sonia, right, you will be then covering more the operational aspects using the monitoring data to do the troubleshooting and all that. So I want to first focus on how do we get stuff into production? Now, Buddha, you also mentioned GitOps and I, I'm, I'm, I love GitOps and I, I would say uh, GitOps is a really, it, it's not just uh, in infrastructure as code done right, but I think it's full stack as code done right, because it's obviously spanning from infrastructure to the application. Um, I want to highlight though first that GitOps, as great as it is, it also requires a new approach to observing and measuring DevOps efficiency. And here's why. The way I see the world, and again, you know, please, please feel free to also correct me or challenge me. But in the classical monolithic world that we used to live in, and some of us still live in, the complexity of building monolithic applications was really all on, on the dev side, because this is where you had a joint repository of code where multiple teams had to figure out how all of the code works together. You had to invest a lot of time in continuous integration, where you had to figure out how all the different components actually make up an app where you did your validation and your security checks. And then we had tools like Jenkins that were then able to come up with, I would say a more 
simpler kind of construct, like a monolith that then uh, allowed, allowed a little bit more of simple operations to deploy, observe, and operate a well-defined app. And I think with the emergence of GitOps, we also saw obviously the move towards breaking the monolith into smaller pieces. I think in the cloud native world, we definitely ended up in a way where we have engineering teams develop individual services rather than building big monolithic applications. Obviously, there's a debate on what what is when does it make sense to build a monolith versus when does it make sense to build services. However, I think the move was great because we made development simpler. We we were boosting, I think, efficiency on the output of individual development teams. However, what this really meant, we were shifting right the complexity of actually running applications that are still applications that are built now of multiple capabilities, multiple services toward operations. The whole app composition problem, like what is really an app, what type of services in which version running on which infrastructure, on which cloud services really make up version one or version two of your app. So the reason why I bring up this slide is because I think we see a shift here and the shift is also important when you talk about measuring your efficiency from a Dora perspective, because if you look at the top, if you measure the monolithic way, you had to, it took a long, long time to build everything and then push it over. Now, if you measure Dora in the new world, in the cloud native world, only on individual services, you all of a sudden see a lot of new services being deployed all the time, but it doesn't really mean that you really deploy new features, new apps to your end users, right? So uh, this is the, the challenge with the app composition. What does now make up an app? And this is the problem that we try to address with the open source project captain, bringing visibility A into the new cloud native world as you're building microservice based applications, but also bringing application awareness into the observability aspect that we bring in. So what does this really mean? Captain, what is Captain? Captain is an automated app aware observability uh, toolkit that gives you visibility into all of your GitOps and Kubernetes deployments. So what you need, or what you hopefully already have is your GitOps tools, whatever you like, your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, you pick your observability tool of choice. I, Sonia, I tried to do a good job and put in all of the logos that you had. Uh, if I miss any of the logos, don't be offended. Any any observability tool that can deal with open telemetry, Prometheus, or any of the other open standards uh, have a, a you know should be up should be placed up here. But there was limited space. So I put the stuff on there that I see on a day to day basis. Now. What we do from a captain perspective, the only thing you need to do is you need to install captain. We call it the, the latest version or the latest iteration of captain is the so-called captain lifecycle toolkit. You just install it on your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we have a couple of things that I will show in the demo later on where you can instruct captain on what to actually observe and what not to observe and what to do. But once you do and your developers are pushing code changes into Git, and then your GitOps tool of choice, I will use Argo later on for my GitOps tool of choice, will then do the deployment. From that point on, Captain will automatically create and give you insights, actually using both Prometheus and also open telemetry so that you automatically get the dashboards that show you the key Dora metrics, how often you deploy, uh, how long it takes to deploy, how many deployments fail. And the beauty of it is because we are basing this all on an open standard or on open standards, you can look at this data in, in this case, it's a Grafana screenshot, but you can also look at the same metrics, for instance, in Dynatrace. And we're not only creating metrics, we're also creating traces. So we're using open telemetry in case you are not yet familiar with it. We're actually using open telemetry to not trace in the traditional sense, a transaction of your deployed application from end user to database we are actually tracing the whole deployment process from the first step that your GitOps tool does to apply changes to Kubernetes until the whole application is deployed. So we're expanding actually open telemetry from the initial use case to a new use case, monitoring and tracing a deployment end to end. And how this looks like, I'll come to in a second also in the demo. Um, how does this technically work in case you're interested in it? Technically, Captain, is a Kubernetes operator that you install on your uh, Kubernetes cluster. And to give you a quick example, if you have an app that is made out of three services, front end, back end storage in different versions, then what we actually do, what our operator does, if you're instructed to do so through some annotations on your Kubernetes uh, deployment manifests, we automatically 
measure the time each individual service takes. What, the, what do we do with this? We are measuring it. That means we're creating metrics and also traces for every single deployment, front-end, back-end, and storage, including the time span, obviously, right? How long does it take? Now, we are introducing an, also an application concept because I told you earlier, the big challenge is to figure out when you're not the, that you deploy individual services, but how long does it really take to deploy an update to an application? Because an update could be updating one service or five services. And so we are allowing you to define the application context. And then we also measure automatically when you're making an update to one or multiple components of your application. We're measuring the pre time. So when does the whole update start? When are the individual updates being done of the services or the workloads? And when, when is it, when is it fin uh, finally done? And uh, we are also, again, creating metrics and traces. And you see here pre and post. What we also do, and this is a really a nice side benefit of what we also built into Captain. It's not just giving you observability. We also allow you to execute tasks. So we can also use Captain to orchestrate actions pre-deployment and post-deployment. Now, why is this important? One of the metrics in Dora is failed deployments or successful deployments. So we can use Captain after a deployment is done to execute a task within your Kubernetes namespace and have it, for instance, figure out, is my app really up and running, right? You can execute some tests, you can validate it, or you can validate your SLOs by going back to your observability platform. We can also use pre-deployment tasks to pre-deployment, validate if it actually it's a good time to deploy the application right now because maybe your external dependencies are not there or maybe your environment is currently under quarantine and we can actually stop the Kubernetes scheduler from deploying your pods. All right, so this is what we technically do. We are an operator that really traces and monitors and observes the complete end-to-end -end deployment of your application that consists that can consist of one or many workloads, and we can even execute pre and post deployment tasks. Now, how does this look like when we look at the trace that we generate? So when you are applying the changes, you manually or your GitOps tool, uh, this is now a visualization uh, how it looks in Jaeger. I'll show this in the demo as well, but just to make it easier to, to, to visualize. When you're deploying an app update of version 301, as you can see here, then we automatically start creating a trace, but not a single node trace. We are creating a full application trace, application deployment trace. That means this actually consists of the pre-app deployment tasks that we can execute, and it checks before the app should be deployed. Then for every workload, so your front-end service, your back-end service, your database service, whatever service, Captain will then create spans on that trace that show you how long did it take to do the pre-checks for the workloads? How long did the actual deployment take of that workload? And how long did the post-deployment checks take? Remember, post-deployment checks could be checking if the deployment is really successful by executing some tests. And we do this for every single workload, for the front-end service, the back-end service, the database service, whatever it is. Once all of them are done, in the end, we also execute the post-app deployment tasks, and we measure this as well. So this is a trace, and we look into this in the demo. And obviously, we also get not just traces, we also get metrics, as I showed earlier. You can put it into any type of tool that you like, but I think I talked enough and I did enough slides. Let me go over to my environment. First of all, what I have is I have a Kubernetes cluster that is uh, instrumented in my case, and the data for me ends up in, in, in Dynatrace. In the end, I send, it doesn't matter if you send it to Datadog, New Relic, or any other tool, Honeycomb. I use Dynatrace because that's what I do during my day-to-day -day life. What I have is I have my, uh, my, app, uh, my app Git repository here. And as Buddha said, what's really nice, if I want to change something, right? If I, I have a sample app, it's not very fancy, but if I want to change something, if I want to update my version of my app, the only thing I need to do is, right? If I have a new uh, container image, the only thing I need to do, and let me just commit this, I'm deploying a version 402. Oops, not, not sharp S, that's it. If I commit it, then what I have here, I have my Git update, this could be now, obviously, application configuration as code. This could also be infrastructure as code. Um, but what I'm basically instructing now my tool to do, 
My tool, my GitHub tool of choice is Argo. You can use Flux or anything else. I, I don't really care, but Argo is now updating and pushing my changes out. And what is happening, if you can see this here, we have some annotations where I actually instruct the captain operator that this is really a workload it should look into, it should, it should observe and trace. And here are also the pre and post deployment actions that we can execute. Now, what this does, I'll explain in a second. Argo is pushing out these things. Captain is now working in the background. And what Captain actually does, it automatically starts tracing and it starts monitoring and observing the deployments that happen in my system. Now I can look at this data now because it's all based on open standards. Either here I have Grafana installed and I can see what's happening and what, what's, what's currently happening in my environment. I can also look at it in, right? Because this is uh, a, an open standard. So I'm using Dynatrace here to also visualize the workflows. So earlier today, I deployed version one, two, and three, as you can see. And if I refresh, I should probably also see a uh, version number four as a trace coming in, hopefully any second. <clears throat> Let's see, version number four is coming in already. Perfect. So every time now a deployment happens, I get a trace. So let me actually open up quickly this trace here, version three and four. I think probably version number four is still ongoing. Uh, but if I look into this trace, I can see this is the deployment that I did earlier. So I, or by making my Git commit, I basically said, I want to change the desired state. Argo was applying the desired state to my Kubernetes cluster. And what I see here is an end-to-end -end trace, right? If I go here, end-to-end -end trace on how my deployment actually made it to Kubernetes, including my pre-deployment tasks, my pre-workload tasks, the actual deployment with timings, also with additional information about like if I click on these individual nodes, we also have so-called attributes. So when you are uh, creating these open telemetry spans like we are doing with Captain, you can add as much metadata that is needed. So I know exactly what type of app, what type of version uh, is actually being deployed. This is all here. And if I now go over to, you see version number four, it's already almost done. Uh, the pre the pre deployment tasks are coming in, um, full end to end trace. Now, why is this important from an efficiency perspective? Because I want to know how long does it take to make to get a deployment done. How long do my pre and post deployment checks take? When are they failing? Hey, I'm executing a test, and the test takes all of a sudden five minutes instead of one minute. It is slowing me down from an efficiency perspective, maybe. So this is the stuff where we can use open telemetry to get those insights. And as I said, right, you have the individual traces. That's great. But if you want to look at it more from a higher level perspective, right, you can also look at this in dashboards to see when did it deploy, what particular version, how long did it take, deployments over time, and just to really show that you can do this in any type of tool, right? You can do this in in, in your observability tool of choice, as long as this observability tool uh, understands and, and supports these standards. All right, last but not least in the, uh, in the demo that I wanna show, if I look at my deployment YAML, you saw earlier that I have pre and post deployment tasks. It says notify here for a pre-task and the post-task. What notify really does, it is actually executing uh, a um, where are my tasks? Here are my captain tasks. So captain actually allows you to um, one of the options is that you can write a JavaScript function that we then execute um, as kind of like a serverless function. And this function here is actually sending out a Slack notification. So through and through a declarative way, right? Declarative on the deployment, I basically where's my Slack? Here's my Slack. I now see that my version four got deployed and I got two notifications because I said I want to call this child this function pre and post deployment all right so there's more that I could demo but in considering the time I want to bring it home and then pass it over to to Sonia I just want to end up with with one thing here I showed you the whole thing on a single cluster but really the end goal with this is because you probably have multiple different environments. So that means you're not constrained with what we're doing here and what you saw 
to a single environment, what we really want with Captain and with getting the observability in, I'm just uh, drawing this out here. We want to give you end-to-end -end traceability from first Git commit all the way from development all the way into production. This is what we're aiming for. And I think this is what open telemetry enables and open standards enable so that in the end, we can really get to a world where we can enable developers to easier develop their individual services, but also reduce the complexity and give you the insights for operations so that they know what they are getting is actually there to stay and is good. And hopefully this was insightful, but now it's time, I think, to pass it over to Sonia, who <laughs> will focus more on the operate and monitor piece of the whole thing. Thank you, Andy. It was really interesting. Uh, every time I see this demo, I think we need to, to contribute a demo with an API gateway and an API definition that we can also push to the yes. stages and have some fun. Exactly. And uh, using open API, so one more standard to that, I think that would be really great. So mm -hmm. something for the yeah. future for us to work on. Uh, uh, just, if you Sonia, could just, stop sharing just before, your screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, while you're doing that, Sonia, just a quick question, uh, Andy. I think there's a couple couple of questions have come through mm -hmm. um, from Gabriel. Thank you so much for the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, he asks, uh, is there a demo with Flux CD um, as the first question? So perhaps uh, is there a demo? I, I'm sure I don't think we're doing that today, but is there a demo that the, he might be able to reference? Uh, I uh, I don't have a demo with Flux CD, but it's the same concept, right? I just use, I mean, you can just install Captain on your Kubernetes cluster. If you use Flux, you get the same thing. Right. I'm just using Argo. And as for tracing, again, there's open telemetry traces. And yes, I showed Dynatrace, but you can see here, this is the same trace in uh, in, Graf oh, in Jaeger. So, so it, any, any, any tool that essentially supports open telemetry, this is going to work. Any perfectly. tool, any, any tool. tool. And I really tried. That's why I put all of the logos on there. Yeah. <laughs> of course, my tool of choice is Dynatrace because that's what I use every day. But as you can see here, yeah. Hmm? Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for the questions, uh, Gabriel. Over oh, to you, Sonia. Thank you. So let me share my screen. Okay, and now we are here. So we shifting things to production and yeah, that's not typically the way it should be, but it's still most of when developers do something commit and then it lands to production and what happens then? What, what, what's, what's the next step? And if we go back to our circle, we are now going to the, once we have deployed and we are operating, we start to monitor because you want to know what's happening in production. Everybody knows you could test as much as you want your application, your services, but when it's in production, customer will start using it in some different combination that you haven't tested. and and all the services interconnected different versions so you will have new learning and this is what we are going to talk about today in my in the part of my presentation so i've called that learning from production so once it's in production what can you learn from how your systems are running how your apis are running and there's kind of two different learning there is one that's the really really technical part where you want to know are there any errors that i need to act on now is anything going really, really, really wrong? Do I need, uh, do I have many more traffic? Is something happening? Do I need to have auto scale? Do I need, can I scale down and save some money? Um, is there any error configuration resource? Do I need to act uh, if possible automatically without having somebody that needs to be work, woken up in middle of the night? And then there is more than improvement, continuous improvement on the product side. As a product manager, manager I want to learn from how the users are using my application, my services, what can I improve? How can I provide a better services? Maybe what are they not using? So we can also deprecate some things to really reduce um, and be more efficient on the services that we're offering. And all this you can learn from production using observability data and open telemetry because it's vendor neutral, as we were discussing, it's one standard, one um, protocol format uh, that you can send to many, many different observability vendor and open source platform. And, but you need only to do the instrumentation once. And this is why we're working on it in to have it in the tech gateway because uh, it's super valuable. Also, when you have APIs, you don't have typically a front end. So you just expose your APIs to your external users. 
and you don't have um, session monitoring, you don't have a UI to monitor to see what users are doing, where are they clicking. So you really need those inside the gateway is the first things that hit the traffic from your customers. And this is where you can observe what is going wrong, what is going well, and what you can learn. What's even better is if not only the gateway sends data, but also all the other services, because then you really get this nice end-to-end -end trace, end-to-end -end visibility to be able to understand how much time is spent in the API gateway. If, if there's an error, is it an error configuration on the gateway? Is it something that is happening much later in the upstream services? And at which point, which team needs to act and to solve that, that issue? So let's look. I have one more trace that I wanted to show. So before we look into, so for this demo, I'm using Dana Trace because that's Andy Tulov's choice and we are happy to have him. So we wanted to take this opportunity. Um, this is an example of how end-to-end -end trace looks like. So you've seen it also for Andy presentation that was more about the deployment. And here's really a trace of a HTTP request and you can see it's hitting in that example, first the front end. So the front end is hosted on the side, then the gateway. And in the tag gateway, there's different middleware operation, checking the version. So you could have different versions to your APIs and redirect it to the right version. Uh, you could have a cache with limiting and then sending to a services uh, that could be gRPC, GraphQL, REST, whatever. And then uh, seeing everything that's going on in that services and then the call being successful. And if you send uh, so I'm using for this demo, the open telemetry demo. The open telemetry community has been working on a demo. It's a shop and you can, you can run it in Kubernetes or in Docker and there's different products. You can click on it, add things to cart, buy things. And all of this is in, instrumented with different services. And what we have done at TAC is we have changed it a little bit to add uh, our API gateway in the in the mix. So the API, all calls are going to the API gateway that then does the redirection, the forwarding to the upstream services that are using gRPC. And when we send the traces, the data in Dana trace, we can get a really, really nice overview of how the tag gateway is doing. So the typical service metrics, the response time, so it's all running on my computers. <laughs> so no, no network, so it's pretty fast. It's not that much of traffic. You can see the failure rates that looks pretty decent. You can see the throughput and then you can go over to the traces. And this is uh, one view that already gives you inf information about the infrastructure. So this is the place where that you would use for auto scale to see, oh, there's a lot of progress coming up. We need more gateways, we need to scale. Uh, there are too many errors. Do we need to wake somebody up? Do we need to, to, to act to do something automatically? But that's not all with API observability because that's really the more the infrastructure is the gateway running fine. But when you're doing with APIs, you're more interested to learn also about the usage of the different APIs, so more granular level. And you can do all that. So if you have the data, you can create some nice dashboard visualization, kind of like a BI <laughs> tool to look at the data and you can really uh, have um, so I created a dashboard with the metrics uh, with the traces the metrics based on the traces that are ex that are based on the open telemetry data that tech is exporting and here I can see okay which are my most popular API requests so I see the product catalog service is the most used one where that's got most of the requests and then the card service so I can see all my services I can see the response code so more often it's like successful 200 response code but ooh, here i see yeah the errors there's there's quite there's some errors that are coming from my checkout service and i've already some 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 information that it's the errors are coming for the middleware part in tag that is responsible for weight limiting so maybe let's take a look uh first in the let's check if there's even really a problem so i'm going to try here checkout place order yeah that doesn't work Okay, so we need to check that. And I can look at the distributed traces. Oh yeah, I see there are some traces, some transactions that are having errors with that API with the checkout. And this is the beauty of the distributed traces, the end-to-end -end traces. At just one look, I can see, okay, there's an error that's coming from the rate limit um, uh, part in the checkout service, so the checkout service API. And oh, API rate limit exceeded. Oh, okay. So 
uh, either somebody is making too many requests or I have, a, I have misconfigured something. I can go to tag, to my API definition. I can check it. Let me check, let me check. Yeah, I have my rate limit. Oh, yeah, I have only one request per minute. So that's that's really that somebody made an error. So let me let me uh, increase that. And obviously here I'm doing it in our in our API manager, but that's something that you would do as code. So part of the API definition, something that you would put like um, to the whole GitHub process and just automate. But here it's more easier to show it to you like this. I have updated my API definition. And now if we look, if we refresh a little bit and wait, at some point we'll see that the errors are no longer in common. Let's check if I can if I can place my order. Yeah, I could place my order. And that's really the beauty of open telemetry and to end tracing. You see the error directly. Is it something in the gateway misconfiguration? Or is it something your upstream services? And sometimes it's not an error per se so the maybe technical engineers well no that was not an error you know that was how it's supposed to be so it's kind of but as a product manager i can go there and see what other errors that my that my user are having and if many er, users are having error with rate limiting with authentication with wrong path then i can look at the documentation that i have for my apis i can improve my sample code so it's not only always about the code per se or the application but it also the enablement of those apis so that's all for my demo and, and i want to and i want to add first of all awesome demo and i want to add again especially for people like gabriel i know we showed the visualization of these traces in dynatrace or sonia showed it but you can view this in any type of tool that understands open telemetry but what I like about your demo is, right, you, you showed a very common use case in distributed systems where you have API gateways or service meshes or whatever it is between services. And if somebody makes a configuration mistake and therefore stops API calls from going from A to B and stopping there for something critical like an order transaction, then you want to be notified as fast as possible and you want to have the data that shows you the problem is there. It's a rate limit, right? Or whatever else it is, yeah. But this was a really, really nice. Absolutely, it's a really, really good uh, demonstration for both of you, actually. And I think just that on that last point, um, there is true business implication of something like this, where it's not just about having the best possible product experience. And I mean, obviously, that is very important. That is what people would probably pay for if they are using a paid product. Uh, they want the best experience possible. They want their users to be able to use your product better. But at the same time, it's also about um, you know uptime conversations and SLAs. And I think there is the entire sort of commercial aspect of support of, um, of a particular product. And I think the faster you can respond and identify an issue and, you know, resolve it, hopefully, um, you know, there is, there is true commercial implications of that, the support packages that go along with it, all of that comes down to true business implications of what we have looked at. So it may, at the face of it, it is it is a fairly technical thing that we we looked at. We are looking at, you know, um, GitOps, we are looking at open telemetry, but there are true business implications of everything that we, you are seeing here. The end-to-end -end ability to look at things from an end-to-end -end perspective, what is going on internally, what's right, what's wrong, how do you improve, how do you uh, get better, how do you make better decisions? All of that, again, has implications both from an engineering perspective as well as from a business perspective. So it's a pretty overall approach to efficiency that we looked at today. Mm. And, and one thing to add here is I know that many organizations in the past have developed their own tools and own standards on how to collect data from different parts of the infrastructure and maybe written it to their custom databases or wherever don't do this anymore because we have open telemetry, we have open standards. If you miss observability in a particular piece of your infrastructure, in particular processes, then don't implement something that is custom, proprietary. Use open telemetry. There's SDKs for pretty much every language out there. You can create open telemetry traces, logs, and metrics. And then you can use any observability tool that supports these standards to look at the data, to analyze, to alert on it. 100%. And I think that's the that's the beauty of it. Again, open standards in general, open telemetry in this case specifically, 
the idea is that you don't have to think about hooking into specific systems that have their own language, their own requirements. You don't need to do that anymore. You can have this common language that is spoken across different systems and solutions. And you've, like Sonia mentioned, once you've set that up inside your um, inside your system uh, and inside your solution, it is going to be applicable to any other uh, integration in the future, even if it's not today. But you know, if you want insights later on, you would still have that ability to to integrate with those solutions a lot easier uh, than having to write either a middleware or a plugin or some kind of a hook to be able to connect to that system in its own language and not having to maintain like five or six or maybe 10 different systems altogether. So uh, that's the beauty of it. That's the productive. Hopefully the efficiency part of things comes out a little bit better. Um, there's a question again from Gabriel. I think we'll you share the slides. In fact, I'll do you one better. We will be sharing the entire presentation. This uh, entire video recording will be made available to everyone here. So you shouldn't have any issues with that once to follow along if you wanted to. Um, from a questions perspective, I think there is one thing that, um, Andy, you touched upon. And I think just I wanted to clarify and sort of re-emphasize that a little bit where a lot of times when we think about open telemetry sometimes it is looked at it from looked at from a very transactional perspective whereas what you mentioned today was very much from an end to end application side of things so if you could maybe just you know clarify that a little bit or maybe just yeah. uh, reinforce that in the minds of everyone who's yeah. listening yeah thank you so much for the question so obviously open telemetry i think at least it was born out of the necessity and the need to trace end to end transactions in business critical apps but we can use open telemetry for any use case. And whether it is the deployment use case that I've shown, some from Git commit all the way into production, you can also think about business process monitoring, right? If you have business processes that are spanning multiple systems where you even have, you know, wait time in between, right? Think about an order process. Um, there's also ways in open telemetry to create traces and spans that are then linked together so you can really think about tracing end to end from the first time you reach a customer and get their interest until they ship the product. I mean, even that's possible. And right? so um, that's why open telemetry is not constrained to the classical tracing use case for tracing business transactions in business critical apps. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that response. Um, the next question that we have, this is probably over to Sonia in this case, where uh, typically when we think about open telemetry, I think we, obviously us working in the API management side of things, there is different API styles that we have to deal with at the API gateway level. Uh, a lot of the conversations typically tends to go towards the REST APIs today, because this is obviously the most popular standard. Uh, but equally, could something like open telemetry help us get better insights with say a GraphQL API or perhaps a gRPC API, all of which have, they work a little bit differently. They provide different insights. They have different operational models internally. So um, could open telemetry be extended to probably give us better insights into those? Uh, yes. So as you mentioned with REST, it's just easy, straightforward. We know all the fields. So there is a semantic convention with open telemetry kind of defines standard fields that everybody use, you know, HTTP response code. And, and then it's really helpful because in the tool, when you want to generate from different sources the data, you can use those semantic convention to create filter. Um, but there are some things that are still missing, for example, for GraphQL, because for example, what is a GraphQL error? When you have GraphQL, you could have, uh, you know, calling two different services and just getting data from one. And then the response of the GraphQL would be a HTTP 200. So open telemetry would interpret it as something that was successful, even though you are missing some part of the data. That's something that we're also looking into. And um, I will have a talk at KubeCon with one of our colleagues, uh, Ahmed. Hi. <laughs> so we are going to explore that topic. And I think that's something that we are going to push also for a new set of specification in the next month. Thank you so much. This has been fantastic. I think we are exactly one minute uh, to uh, the hour today. So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you so much panelists. It has been an incredible conversation. I have thoroughly enjoyed learning all about open telemetry, Captain Tyke, Dynatrace, and the entire workflow that goes into making um, application lifecycle more efficient in this case. So thank you everyone. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. All right, guys, until next time, we've got uh, uh, another webinar coming up next week about where, we, where we'll be looking at declarative approach to API management in Kubernetes. 
um, next week on the 23rd of March as it stands. So do make sure that you join us for that. We'll go a little bit deeper into some of the concepts that we discussed today and stay tuned for more as we go along. So thank you so much, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Uh, until next time, take care and have a lovely day ahead. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.